Jesus. I love you, Lord. Uh, good morning, Northside Christian Church. I'm here today. It's uh, the day before Independence Day, the 4th of July. And so, as you uh, probably could guess, I'm say something about the United States today. Something about America. Um, and we're going to go through several scriptures and um, see what it is. As I was um, thinking about it, this one thing kept popping in my head. I wanted to talk about how America is the land of liberty, how it's the home of the brave, something like that. And as I started working and kind of thinking about it and you know praying and seeking God's wisdom and stuff, um, I just got caught up on one thing, like what was going to be my intro, I didn't even get past it, I decided i just make the whole sermon about it, it's very important, we might, in the future, might be seeing some more America sermons, but, <clears throat> the land of opportunity, so, yeah, the land of opportunity, so, as we know, America has, over the years, been known as the land of opportunity, and I wanted to kind of play on that and just uh, talk about how, just as people come here um, to seek opportunity, um, America itself also has to live up to its opportunity. So, um, you guys got your Bibles? Okay. <laughs> all right. So, as you all know, America is known as a land of opportunity. People come here from all over the world looking for adventure, freedom, a chance to start a, a new. Uh, they're coming here for wealth, success, a better life. Um, yeah, wealth, success, a better life, a chance to realize, create, and pursue dreams and destinies. People looking for, and they might be look, looking for escape from hardship, disaster, or even just a safe refuge. Um, and all around the world, we know that America has been known, or is a pride and joy across the world. But today, I want, us, I want to ask the question, have our hearts turned away from God? Have we become more selfish, bitter, and hateful than ever before? And like I said before, we're known as the land of liberty, we're known as the land of freedom, but are we offering that same kind of blessing, those same kind of uh, love and characteristics to others outside our borders, or even those who may be coming in? So today we're going to look at several texts um, in, the, in the scriptures, and we're also going to look at the history of Israel. Um, we're going to look at some of the failures um, that I believe are present in America, and we're going to look at the present state of the church um, to show that as the land of opportunity, America has the opportunity and responsibility to be a blessing to the nations. So we're going to look at uh, some of the history of Israel and some of Israel's past, and you might be asked, why are we looking at Israel? <laughs> Granted, America is not Israel, but Israel, as you know, was meant to be a light to the nations. Um, you can look back throughout all the Old Testament history and know that God designed, wanted to raise up Israel, not because they were better than anyone, not because they were more powerful than anyone, but because... Um, he wanted to display his glory through him. He wanted to bring, to let the whole world know about God through his people Israel. And I kind of stole, I didn't steal, I kind of took some of, some of this about what I'm going to say about light is from a sermon by Bob Deffenbaugh, I believe is how you say his name, um, from the series Following Jesus in a Me First World. And the name of the sermon was Israel's Relationship to the World. So I found this on Bible. I think it's Bible.org or Bible.com. Um, he writes articles and seemed like a pretty well-to-do guy, um, well-respected guy. So some of this stuff I got from his sermon, pretty good. So like I said, his, uh, Israel was meant to be a light to the nations, and that was her purpose. And that's Israel is, she still is a light to the nations, and especially because of Jesus. Jesus, as you know, came through Israel. Um, and like I said, though we're not Israel, the United States has an opportunity and can follow suit to be a light to the world. In fact, I believe America should be. Um, and so I'm just gonna we're gonna recap Promised Land story. We know that Israel was once slave or once slaves in Egypt, and God brought them out of Egypt. To, um, as we know, he, he brought all the plagues on Pharaoh. He led them with miraculous signs and wonders out of Egypt 
through the desert to the mountain where they received the law. Um, yeah, where they received the law, and then he took them from there and was trying to lead them through the promise. And you know, they had some struggles on the way, but God took them out of slavery and eventually into his promised land. He had a destiny for them. Um, and, is, and the purpose of them going to the promised land was so that they would remain faithful in the land and enjoy it. Not just so they could just go there and just do whatever the heck they wanted and be like the rest of the world, be like the rest of the nations. But God wanted them to be different. He wanted them to be set apart. And they were meant to rise. They were meant to shine. Israel was meant to be glorious, but it was for the sake of showing God to the rest of the nations. And so here's so just some proof from the, the Bible. I'm just going to read some verses. Genesis 18, 18. Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Genesis 22, 18. In your seed, still talking to Abraham. Well, yes. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So, remember, it's not just about Israel. It's God's goal is eventually to reach the nations. Um... I didn't read over. This is from Isaiah. Uh, I flipped the page. Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. <sighs> okay. That's a pretty cool word. Psalm 96, 3. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the people. So, once again, it's extending to the nations. Psalm 57, 9. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praise to you among the nations. Psalm 105, 1 through 2. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders. And... If you know anything about the story with David and Solomon, I think uh, when Solomon built the temple, um, God spoke this to him, and he still talks about how the nations of the earth would come to the temple and worship God. And I'll read, this is from 1 Kings 8, 41 through 43. I'm just reading through verses. So you guys don't have to look these up. These aren't our main texts yet. These are just quick little um, snippets. So foreigners who do not belong to your people Israel will come from a distant land because of your reputation. When they hear about your great reputation and your ability to accomplish mighty deeds, they will come and direct their prayers toward this temple. Then listen from your heavenly dwelling place and answer all the prayers of the foreigners. Then all the nations of the earth will acknowledge your reputation, obey you like your people Israel do, and recognize that this temple I built belongs to you. So here we see the, the point is that the nations would recognize who God is, that they would learn to obey God, and everyone would be blessed through it. So, yes, that's Israel, that's God's chosen people, but I believe we as Americans in, in America, we have kind of that opportunity to be a light to the nations. Um... Real quick, um, this is something I want us to think about. We know that when the Jews, they went into the promised land, it was kind of a, maybe a controversial, controversial topic to some people, but God ordered them to kill, destroy everything, kill everybody. And these were the Canaanites, the people living in the land. And God said, it's not because of your righteousness, it's because of the wickedness of the people living in the land. So it might be controversial to you, but there are times when God is, ordered his people to, to destroy everybody and everything for the sake of his name. But the, remember, we have to remember that these are different from the Gentiles. Canaanites versus Gentiles. Gentiles just refers to the nations in general. Foreign people, people who are not God's people. And, um, what was I thinking? Um, and these, actually, God made references um, and provision in his laws to take care of the Gentiles, to to accommodate them if they wanted to be part of Israel, to welcome them in if they wanted to commit their ways to the Lord. So God was not against Gentiles. God's heart is actually to let Israel be a light to them. So I want us to remember Canaanites were the people God wanted Israel to destroy, and the Gentiles are just everyone in general. 
And this might also be a controversial thing. Um, we're going to look at it. So we talked about the history of Israel. Now I want to kind of compare that to some of America's history. Um, as we know, the people who came and colonized America and moved in here were not originally born in America. They were other peoples here. They were Native Americans and, you know, they worshipped whatever and followed their <coughs> rituals and stuff. And people from Europe and Spain, we came in and we we, in a lot of ways, we killed a bunch of them and cleared out the land, basically, and tried to colonize it. I'm sure, I know some people did want to make peace with them and, you know, whatever, but all in all, it was, in some ways, it was like the destruction of the Canaanites when God's people moved in and cleared everybody out. And America kind of has a history of that, whether it was complete 100% right, 100% wrong, some people say that they were being led by God, and it's something known as manifest destiny, you've probably heard about, um, or know about. Um, it's where, um, it's just where they believe that God was leading them just to take over the land, to civilize it, conquer whatever, um, to make the place fruitful and abundant, to, in some ways, maybe to establish a righteous nation. So in some ways, that America's past is kind of like the land of Israel's past, or the promised land. Um, so, just something to think about, um, but I want us to, the important point is, what was the point of after they made it to the promised land? Israel's purpose was, once they got there, was to remain faithful and serve God and enjoy the land, to be a light and blessing for other nations, and allow them to come to God as well, so that the earth might learn to enjoy God. See, once you get to the promised land, you also have a responsibility once you're there. So America moves in, I mean, white people, I guess, move into America. What are we going to do with it? And we know we have a good, some good history, some not so good history. You know, we're humans and we're working things out. But um, when, you, when God calls you into the promised land, or when he called Israel, he wanted to make sure that once they got there, they stayed obedient because... The thing about God is when you're in a desperate need, when you're in the desert, so to speak, when you have nothing and you learn to depend on God there, I mean, you depend on God and everything kind of, your spirit in some ways seems to soar. But when you get to a place where you can enjoy it, you're comfortable, you have everything you need, um, you have the potential to start to get prideful. You could start to say, oh, I'm the one who made all this wealth for myself. I don't need God anymore. Lord forbid me ever saying that. Um, and it's just crazy because... Um, because you start to enjoy your land and enjoy your blessings, all this stuff, more than you do God. In the promised land, blessings can become idols. And so God gave them instructions and provisions to let them know, um, hey, keep obeying me once you get into the promised land. And that's why God had them in the desert out for so long, because they didn't know how to obey them. They were a stiff-necked people. And so... Um, in the promised land, or I'm just, we're going to look at some verses. I know it's a lot. It's from Deuteronomy. You can read through it. A lot of it is kind of um, resounding. It's a lot of it. It says a lot of uh, the same things. Um, but I'm just going to read it. You don't have to turn there. It's up on the screen. But I want us to notice the key points in these about obeying, continuing to obey God. Um, obey Him when you're in the promised land so you don't forget or else all your blessings might cause you to sin. So, Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 9 says, See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. Once again, it's so to show wisdom and understanding to the nations. Who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen. Oh, are we still on the screen? Okay. Um, or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. So it was 
God he kind of commanded that they remain faithful. Um, and it's going to show everybody else how great God is. Deuteron Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 3. Uh, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Um, here, Israel. Okay. Here, Israel. And be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. And we're going to skip to verse 10 through 12 of that same chapter. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, listen here, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Deuteronomy 8. Once again, he's getting further and further. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, look down a little bit in there. Uh, okay. Where was that? Revering him. Revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. So there's a lot of good things in the promised land that the Israelites did not make for themselves. When you, this is the longest one, okay? Um, the whole longest chapter we've been going through. When you have eaten and are satisfied, this is important, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> he led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless, waterless land with venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you, you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. So here God basically gives everything you need to know um, just in these chapters about being faithful in the promise and that you have the potential to forget and be prideful. And um, there's a danger because if you don't learn how to obey God when you have nothing, then it's going to be even harder to obey God when you have everything. So, and people can forget. Um, it can also cause you pride when you see all the blessings that are around you 
you, if you forget God and forget to obey Him or don't obey Him, then you start to think, oh, all this stuff, all this wealth, all these blessings are mine. And honestly, Israel failed a lot. Israel failed on many occasions. It actually became racist and prideful, arrogant, and it actually th had thoughts of being better than the other nations, um, and that was because of their own righteousness. Instead of being a light and blessing to the other nations, like um, God had wanted all along, um, and they started to actually hate the other nations, look down and be like, we're better than you, we have everything, you're wrong. And that's like the opposite of what God wanted them to do. Um, but it was because of God's will and purpose that God raised them up, not their own righteousness. So we can lean on grace when we see how even Israel's chosen people didn't get it right. But it was all, all because of God. There's enough evidence of their failures and lowliness. In fact, even one time Israel was called a worm in Isaiah. So hopefully God doesn't call America a worm. But they were meant to be a blessing. Um, and actually, if you know Jesus, when he came because of Israel's failures, Jesus was actually the guy who did everything that Israel couldn't do. Jesus was the guy who made everything right. He, when Jesus came on earth, you see him talking to Gentiles, you see him talking to women, you see him talking to Samaritans. He loved everybody. He did. Israel thought they were right by staying away from the other nations, but they didn't love them. And so Jesus came and he set a different example. Um, so he was their Messiah. Now I want to get to America. America should be an outpouring of blessing to the rest of the world. And in some ways it has been. Um, in some ways it, it is. And a symbol to the rest of the nations. America is also a source of wealth. We, America has, we don't have to, but looking at how much America has, how fruitful it has been, how much wealth there is compared to many other nations of the world, the people we have, the liberty we have, the freedom we have, um, America, I believe, has the potential and the opportunity to be a blessing to other places. Um, it can be a light to the nations, um, pour, pouring out some of its wealth to help others, just like Israel was supposed to do. It could be a source of teaching, teaching good doctrines, the doctrines of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world. If we hear... If America sets an example, people in America set an example of um, just what it is to be a Christian and to live rightly, then I believe other nations will be like, hey, they got it together. They know what they're doing, so we're going to follow Jesus, you know? Um, just like Israel, we're meant to be a symbol. And like I said earlier with the wealth, we're meant to be a source of love to the nations, just to be able to help those in need, rescue those who are perishing, all that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. We have the opportunity to be the land of opportunity. <laughs> so, but here I want to get to some of the failures of America. Is we, in many ways, have forgotten where we came from. We've forgotten who God is. We've forgotten that all these blessings are not our own, uh, but they're given to us from God. Uh, forgetting uh, just the opportunity we have to love others, you know, kind of like, um, in some ways, I wanted to compare us with Israel. Um, so pride in the promised land. I believe, in some ways, one of America's failures is we become prideful. We look down on others, we think we're better than everyone else, and for some strange reason, we think it's all because of us. Which I believe, that if you were born in some other country, you, you would probably be thinking differently. Um, I think some of our greatest uh, failures are, I said, forgetting idolatry this unfortunately there is a plenty of idolatry going on people worshiping whatever they want to worship uh, running after images that come from the earth and not God laziness one of the failures of us pride I already said that and actually uh, comfort um, and I want to I don't know I'll say that for later and arrogance pardon me that's the last one and I think one of the most terrible ones we, in some ways, America has been, uh, some people, I believe, um, can be angry towards other nations. They, they say they want them, they want to leave them out of the blessing that they've received. Some people are completely opposed to anybody from any other country ever 
and they like hate them. They think they're the best, and for some reason there's racism and all sorts of stuff. And instead of wanting to be an opportunity to bless them and even tell them about Jesus, um, we want to leave them out. And you're, we're kind of like trying to hoard all the wealth to ourselves. And that's wrong. Like I said, we're meant to, we could be a blessing to other nations. All right, I might step on some toes, but I believe this is very, um, I don't know, it's something to think about. I believe that there's some truth maybe hidden in this um, about why arrogance is bad, thinking you're better than everyone else, and just because you have been blessed more means you're supposed to help more, like, you know? Um, but I want to to look at this verse from Ezekiel 36, 23. Um, the Lord has been talking to um, the people and because I think it might be an exile but anyway it says I will vindicate the holiness of my great name which has been profaned among the nations uh, which you have profaned in their midst then the nations will know that I am the Lord declares the Lord God when I prove myself holy among you in their sight so the reason I put this verse up is just because God is not opposed to like bringing down his own people because they're being disobedient and mm -hmm. I'm actually going to give a point pretty soon and I'm going to go here but even when God's people are just sometimes God can glorify his name by actually punishing his own people so don't don't think that just because you have everything you're better than everyone else and all that kind of stuff um, that it's because of you and you're all great God could actually do a lot to bring you down and still glorify his name. And I want to bring up this point about, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the radical Muslims and, you know, terrorist things and stuff like that. Um, how do you know whether the acts of radical Muslims is not from the Lord? Be careful. Think about it. We have been given every opportunity, yet maybe... Like, this land's been given every opportunity, yet maybe because of the sins of the people in this land, God is rising up a form of judgment. You don't know. Um, there are several instances where God threatened and used a foreign nation to ravage Israel because of her sins. And these were nations that didn't even serve God, but they were still used by God. They were, you know, you talk about Babylon and the Assyrians. God use them as a form of like a hand of judgment against his own people. And these people, they didn't even obey God, but God still he says he used them. Um, and they were used to discipline Israel, bring her to repentance, um, because he was sickened by her iniquities. God has done it more than once for the sake of his name. He even allowed his people to be carried off and put in captivity. So if God did that to his own chosen people, Israel, what, what makes America better than all that? Who is to say that God may not, because we've been given an opportunity, but maybe we've squandered it, that God may not rise up a form of judgment against America because, you know, of the sins and the failures. And I'm not saying everybody, but um, you don't know. And I already said that about Israel. And Israel was like, God called him his child, his daughter, his wife in some circumstances. And I wrote, certainly the United States is not more privileged than Israel was in God's eyes, but maybe we are. You know, it's a new day. Jesus has come. Um, some might believe that we are better and more highly favored and immune to the wrath of God than anyone else's. But, you know, I believe that we're not immune from, to God's judgment. But I want to say something encouraging. I believe that God is treating us mercifully, that he does have great plans for this country, at least the faithful people in it, and that he is not giving up on us. In fact, I believe that we have just begun. We're only 200 years old, you know, around that. And um, I believe that God has great plans for us. He's not giving up on us, you know. Um, and that we're in a new day, we're in a new age. Jesus has come. There's Christians, there's a lot of Christians here. I believe we have a great potential, a great opportunity, and God is being merciful to us. We have the potential to become one of the greatest nations the world has ever seen. And in fact, in some ways, we were known as that in the past, but even more so now, I believe we have that potential. And if you think it's because we have the most Christians or because we're the most righteous, 
you're wrong. Even though he certainly can use a nation marked by Christians, um, I believe that God makes kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. The earth is God's footstool, so just because you're a country doesn't mean that God can't do whatever he wants with you. Um, so if, it, if the nation gets rised up and it becomes glorious, whatever, it'll, we have to remember it will be because of God's grace and not because of our own righteousness. Um, and like I said, surely that's the goal to be a blessing for the rest of the earth, an outpouring of wealth and wisdom and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want us to um, remember those verses I read at the beginning about how God wants to use his people as a blessing for the nations. I want us to imagine those verses in light of America. I believe that God can use those same verses for us. Um, and I'll just skip ahead uh, rather quickly. Okay. So, I believe having an attitude of pride, hostility, and intolerance toward other nations, cultures, religions, and languages is actually opposite the heart of God. We're like a spoiled brat getting all the wealth, fame, glory, and attention, yet basically turning a blind eye to everybody else. Do you think God made you famous for your own sake or because of your own ability, power, or righteousness? How dare you say such a thing? Surely it was for God's glory and so that we could be a blessing to others. Um, so our hearts should be for others and we shouldn't be arrogant. Um, and like, like I said, it reread earlier, sometimes God humbles his people so that, not because he hates them or because they're also terrible, but so that they will be more like him, so that they will do good and be able to bless others the more blessing they get. Um, and we're going to see a little bit of that in one of the scriptures we're going to look at uh, coming up. But I just want to say that America has a responsibility to be the best we can. We have opportunity and potential, you know, to, to do good and to be good and to share with others. And, you know, that, and Jesus said to his apostles in the Bible, he said, uh, much you have received, you know, much will be demanded of you, or freely you have received, freely give. So we should, you know, have that same attitude in our country. I'm not going to read it, but I want you guys to mark down Ezekiel 31. Like, Ezekiel 31, I don't have it up there, I believe is actually a um, kind of like a scripture that I think is relating to America right now. Talks about how the nation, one of the nations got so prideful or whatever because they were taller and better than everyone else. But God says, No more, I'm going to bring you down. Um, and I, I just want you guys to read that. I was going to read it. But if I have anything to say about Muslims, I think our, our, um, our heart and our responsibility is actually to love them. You know, there's a whole lot of trauma and crazy stuff going on in the world. And, but as Christians, I would say just love them. Um, and I, I thought this was kind of funny and incredible. Why are we treating them so badly? I mean, as, as Christians. And the, you know, there's lots of Muslims wanting to move here and stuff like that. Maybe they're coming here because they feel safe. We, I mean, this is the land of opportunity. Maybe they want to get away from the bad places that they're in. They want to come here. And if lots of people have been praying for Muslims to be saved, maybe... God is actually sending them here to us so that we could tell them about Jesus. Maybe this is the answer to that prayer. Maybe this is our opportunity. And for us to be an answer, maybe God is saying, I'm sending them to you. What do you and you, all you want to do is, is get rid of them. Tell them about Jesus. And he's saying, feed them. You're the best resource I have to help the Muslim community. So this is a different way of looking at it. I think it's very uh, God-like and powerful. Deuteronomy 10, 18 through 19 says stuff about how God loves the foreigner and he wants you to bless the foreigner and teach them about the Lord. So there's a, a quote from Spider-Man. Um, it says, with great power comes great responsibility. So yeah, just leave that here. I think it's from Spider-Man. It is from Spider-Man. The last thing... <coughs> Uh, the church in America. We were talking about America as a whole, but I want to add a little thing about the church in America and how, um, what our state is. 1 Corinthians 10, if you want to turn there, you can. This is, I think, is actually, you know, put towards Christians. So I wanted to save this for when we talk about the Christians in America. 
Um, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. So the people, God, um, this Paul is saying that the people of Israel, they, the ones who were in the desert and went out with the Exodus and stuff, um, they got all the blessing. They saw God do miracles. They received spiritual nourishment. They heard the word of God, all this stuff. And God was still not pleased with them. And I want to say, in America, we have all the resources in the world. We have a bajillion Bibles. We have preachers everywhere on the internet, a million and one churches, just everything. We have all this nourishment available to us, and we have every opportunity, but what if God isn't pleased with us? Because we're just, you can still sin even though you get everything. But Paul says these things occur as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So we don't want to be like them. Do not be idolaters. I'm going to skip down. You know, they engage in idolatry. We could not commit sexual, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and 22,000 would die. We should not test the Lord as some of them did, and do not grumble as some of them did. Um, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. So, they engage in idolatry, sexual immorality, and grumbling. Also, I believe that, unfortunately, that many of the Christians in America have taken this path. Even though we've received everything in spiritual nourishment, we still disobey God. Um, but, and it says in verse 12, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. You might think just because you have everything and you're blessed, it doesn't mean you're still not being disobedient. Um, and this is just what I really want to say, look at about um, America. Even though this was written to the church in Laodicea, Revelation, back in the day, I believe much of this um, is true about the church in America today. I don't have it, I don't have it, I don't have it written out, so... It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, a.k.a. Jesus. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And in that day, in that area, we watched some Revelation videos here in the past. Um, maybe you learned about it, but... The cold water or the hot water is water that has use. It's water that has purpose. It's water that can accomplish something. It's good. The lukewarm water couldn't be used for anything because, you know, use cold water to drink, hot water maybe to wash things or relax in or whatever. And I think they had some irrigation system. But anyway, it had a purpose. It had a use. Lukewarm water is, in some ways, if, if you're being lukewarm, I think it's just you're numb, you're dull, you've... You don't have a purpose because you're not going to commit to anything. You don't. You either. You don't go one way or the other. You're stuck in the middle, and, and in some ways, you won't commit yourself to being really obedient to God or being used as what He wants you to do. And God can't do anything with them because they're numb. And I think Christians in America, in some ways, um, have become numb to God. They've. They've because of all the comfort around them, because of all the blessing around them, they kind of forgot God. And this is very true. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. How, who can say that that is true for many people here? But you do not realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire. We remember that in, when uh, Peter, yeah, Peter was talking, he actually used this kind of image, or maybe Paul, to talk about your faith. Your faith is... Precious, like it can be gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. God wants you to be rich in faith and white clothes to wear, etc., etc. Um, we saw this even in Deuteronomy and Hebrews and other places. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So sometimes bad things that are coming to us may just be God. He wants to discipline us like a son. Um, so repent. 
And one last thing. Um, oh. I was going to say, in America, Christians should be, um, I believe, even though we're the land of the free and the home of the brave, I believe Christians in America are the weakest, the most enslaved, and they're silent. They're letting the pressures of the world crowd them in and crush them down. They don't want to speak out about Jesus. They're afraid of, of things that aren't even visible, you know, um, just pressures and peer pressure and stuff like that. Um, but I just want to give a shout out to the church in America just to be free. Just don't let fear hold you back anymore. Be brave. Follow God. And I believe we have the opportunity to be one of the greatest nations ever, not because of everyone in general, but because of the believers here. We could... Believers here could be reaching the world with media, with pastors, evangelists, missionaries, money, just blessing, allowing people to come in and teach them the gospel. Like I said, God, I believe, is sending people here. Christians here have the opportunity to change the world um, and be that spiritual nourishment. So, uh, just like I said, one last thing is, even though we've been talking about America and all that kind of stuff, that... There's a difference between kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. Yes, America is a nation and we do have a lot of opportunity to do great things, but it's not going to last forever. One day, you know, it might be destroyed because it's an earthly kingdom. You know, it's like we said, the earth is God's footstool. So, you know, he puts his feet on it. You know, it's not like his throne, it's his footstool, heaven is there. Just to remember that America is not the church. The church belongs to the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, which will last forever. Daniel says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will, be left, will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. So just remember... We can enjoy the land we live in, but it's passing away. The kingdom of God is what's going to last forever. And I just, I, I'm going to read this verse, Psalm 126 too. I believe this was once true of this country, and much of its effects are still seen today, but I believe that we could still rise up to this. It says, Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. Um, and I just want to end with a, a song I found. Um, it's a Willie Nelson song. I don't know if you heard of Willie Nelson. <laughs> but it's called Living in the Promised Land. And I thought it was perfect. I was actually looking up America songs to include in the sermon. And of all things, the Willie Nelson song was the best one. <laughs> um, but this is how, how it goes. I'll just gonna read the, the lyrics to you. Give us your tired and weak, and we will make them strong. Bring us your foreign songs, and we will sing along. Leave us your broken dreams. We'll give them time to mend. There's still a lot of love living in the promised land. Living in the promised land, our dreams are made of steel. The prayer of every man is to know how freedom feels. There is a winding road across the shifting sand, and room for everyone living in the promised land. So they came from a distant isle, nameless woman, <coughs> faithless child like a bad dream, until there was no room at all, no place to run, and no place to fall. Give us our daily bread, we have no shoes to wear, no place to call our home, only this cross to bear. We are the multitudes, lend us a helping hand, is there no love anymore, living in the promised land? Living in the promised land, our dreams are made of steel. The prayer of every man is to know how freedom feels. There is a winding road across the shifting sand and room for everyone living in the promised land. Thank you.